Nice to be in the house of the Lord this morning, and seems like we have a little more room. I, I hope it's comfortable for you and that you can all see well this morning. Uh, let us stand together, and we'll ask the Lord to bless us in a word of prayer this morning. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, it's with thanksgiving in our heart that we come to your presence today. Lord, trusting each of us has brought our lick of fire this morning, that each member of the body, Father, may nourish the other, that together we would stand before you as a great people. Lord, we're not a religion, we're a people. We're an elected, predestinated portion of your word for this age. And Lord, we just ask that you would grant your presence in this facility. May it be pleasing to you. Once again, with all of our hearts, we thank you. Lord, may this be a place that you can do great things for people that are in need, that they know the resurrected Savior, our Lord Jesus, still lives. We ask you to bless us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated this morning. This morning, before we do anything, um, I want to play a portion of uh, from the sermon called "God in Simplicity," or "God's Revealed in Sim uh, Hides Himself in Simplicity and Reveals Himself in the Same." And it is the portion of the tape where Brother Branham dedicated um, the tabernacle. Uh, they remodeled the tabernacle, they rebuilt it, they added on to it, they totally changed it. And he took the first few minutes uh, thanking all the people that worked on it and, and I'd like to do the same. And uh, Our sound system is much better. I've never heard myself preach before. Uh, till this morning and and um, and you know uh, brother Mike and brother Billy and brother David and Neville and Billy uh, number two and all of them worked so hard to uh, get our sound going and through the construction brother Tommy brother Andrew many of the brothers helped work many of you put a lot of effort into uh, making this happen and and it's done for you so we'd like to thank all of you that labored it was uh your giving uh that made it your your offerings and your tithings have brought uh made this possible this morning so we certainly want to thank all of you and your effort we it's here to serve you I suppose we could have kept cramming into the other building, but I don't know. Are the pews more comfortable? <laughs> Amen. I hope you're more comfortable. Uh, I hope the air conditioning's good. There might be a lot of little things that we don't know, but we trust that as uh, we go along, we'll make adjustments, and there's probably plenty of adjustments that need to be made, but... Uh, we're, we're thankful for this this morning. So let us, and then right after we listen to this portion of tape, we'll start our first service. So uh, I know people are still probably coming in and we're gonna have to do a little better on that. But listen now to as our messenger begins to speak to us about how that we should conduct ourselves, and what the purpose of the house of the Lord is. So the first person I wanted to preach in this church 
or to speak in this church was God's seventh angel messenger, the prophet of Malachi 4. So God bless you this morning as we listen. God bless you, brothers. Now, in the building, I think that we ought to have in this, if it's been dedicated or going to be dedicated in a few minutes to the worship of God, we should keep it that way. We should never by ourselves in the building. We should never uh, do any business in this auditorium here. It should never be done in here. That is such as permitting ministers to come in and sell books and everything. No matter what it is, there's other places to do that. Water. We, we shouldn't buy and sell in the house of our Lord. It should be a place of, of worship. Holy, consecrated for that purpose. Amen. Let's give us a nice place. Let's dedicate it to Him Amen. and dedicate right, ourselves everybody. with it to Him. And now, this may seem a little rude, but it's not a place to visit. It's a place of worship. We should never even murmur a word inside of here, outside of worship, to one another unless it's absolutely necessary. Amen. We should never rally around. We should never run through the building or let our children run through the building. And so doing this, feeling not long ago that of doing this, we constructed it so we could take care of all of it. Now, we have this set here. Of course, many people are strangers. The tabernacle folks know this, that the building is going to be dedicated to the service of the Almighty. Therefore, dedicating ourselves, let's remember, when we enter that sanctuary, keep still to one another and worship God. Amen. If we want to visit each other, there's places we may visit each other like that, but never walking around where you can't hear yourself think and some person come in and they just don't know what to do. See? It's so much noise and things. It's just humanly. And I've seen it in churches until it has made me feel real bad because we do not come into the sanctuary of the Lord to meet each other. We come here to worship God Amen. and go to our homes. This sanctuary is dedicated to worship. When Stand outside, talk anything you wish to as long as it's right and holy. Go to one another's homes, visit one another's places. But when you enter that door, be quiet. You come here to talk to him, see, and let him talk back to you. The trouble of it is we do too much talking and don't listen enough. Then when we come in here, wait on him. Now, in the old tabernacle, there might not be one person present this morning that was there the day of the dedication when Major Ulrey played the music and I stood behind three crosses here to dedicate the place. I would not permit anybody. The usher stood at the door to see that nobody talked. When you've done your talking outside, you come in. If you desire to, silently, you come to the altar and pray. Silently. You walk back to your seat, open up the Bible. What your neighbor done, that was up to him. You had nothing to say. If you want to talk to him, say, I'll see him outside. I'm in here to worship the Lord. You read his word or sit quietly. And then the music, Sister Gertie, I don't know where she's here this morning or not. Sister Gibbs, the old piano. I'll be set back in this corner, the best of my remembrance. And she would play softly down at the cross where my Savior died, some real sweet, soft music. And, and then until it come time for the service and the song leader got up and led a couple of congregational songs, and then if they had some outstanding solo, they sang it. But never just a bunch of carrying on. And then the music continually played, and then when I heard that, I knew it was my time to come out. When a minister walks into a congregation of people 
praying and the anointing of the Spirit, you're bound to hear from heaven. That's the There's no way to keep from it. But if you walk into confusion, then you, you, you're, you're so confused, the Spirit's grieved, and we don't want that. No, we want to come here to worship. We have lovely homes that I'm going to speak about just in a minute and so forth at home where we visit our friends and take them. This is the house of the Lord. Amen. Now, there's little children. Now, little babies. Now, they don't know no different. They, the only way they can get what they want is cry for it. And sometimes it's a drink of water. And sometimes they need attention. And so we have, by the grace of God, dedicated a room. It is called on the list a cry room, but uh, it's uh, right straight in front of me. It's other words where the mothers can take their babies. Now, it never bothers maybe me here at the pulpit. Maybe I won't even notice it being anointed, but these other people sitting near, and it bothers them, see? And they come here to hear the service. So... The mother's, is, your little baby starts whimpering. You can help that. Well, sure, it's a, you should, you ought to bring it. A real mother wants to take her baby to church, and that's the thing you should do. And we've got a room there the where you can see every corner of the building, all the auditorium, and a speaker there to where you can control the volume any way you want to with a, a little toilet in the end and water basin and everything just exactly for the mother's convenience. With chairs and things, you can sit down, place to change your baby if it needs to be changed, and everything sitting there. It's all fixed. And then, many times, teenage children and sometimes adults will get the, you know, young people of past notes or cut up or something in church. Now, you're old enough to know better than that. See, you should know better than that. See, you shouldn't come here. If you expect to be a real man someday and raise a family to the kingdom of God, then start it off in the beginning, you see, and, uh, and act right and do right. And now, of course, now the ushers stands at the corners of the buildings and so forth, and if any carrying on, they're, they're ordained as their duty and trustees set here in the front that in a case of someone getting misbehaving, there are commissioned to ask the person to keep quiet. Then if they don't have that respect, it would be better that uh, someone else had the seat because there's somebody that wants to hear. There's somebody come for that purpose to hear, and that's what we're here for, is to hear the word of the Lord. Amen. And so everybody wants to hear it more just as quiet as they can be, just as quiet as they can be. That is... Not a bunch of talking and carrying on for somebody worshiping the Lord. That's expected. That's what it should be. That's what you're here for, is to worship the Lord. And just if you feel like praising God or shouting, just go right on. See, because that's what you're here for. Amen. See, but is to worship the Lord in your own way of worshiping. But there's nobody worships the Lord while you're talking and passing notes and you're helping somebody else to get away from the worship of the Lord. See. So we feel that uh, that would be wrong. And we want to make that a ruling in our church, that in our congregation, that to this building, this church will be dedicated to the kingdom of God and to the preaching of the word. Amen. Pray. Amen. Worship. That's the reason you should come here, to worship. Then, and then another thing, when service is over, usually the people in churches, I don't, I don't think it's here because I'm always gone, see? Because I get away usually, even in preaching the other services, the anointing comes and visions happen and I'm wore out and I step off into the room and maybe Billy or some of the men there take me on uh, to home and let me rest a while to get out of it because it's a very much of a strain. And then I have seen churches, though, that were... Uh, the children were permitted to run all over the sanctuary and, and uh, the adults standing and hollering across the room to one another. That's a good way to ruin the service coming at night or whatever time it is. See? As soon as the service is dismissed, leave the auditorium. You're through in the worship end. Then go out and talk to one another. Whatever you want to do, if you got something you want to talk to somebody, uh, 
to see them, or you go with them or to their home or whatever it is, but don't do it in the auditorium. Let's dedicate this to God. Amen. See, this is His meeting place where we meet with Him. See, and the law goes forth from the sanctuary, of course. And uh, uh, I believe that that would be pleasing to our Heavenly Father. And then when you come and you get to find out that gifts are beginning to fall among you. Now, usually, it, I trust it'll never be here. But when people have a new church, the first thing you know, the congregation gets starchy. You never want that to be. After all, this is a place of worship. Amen. This is the house of the Lord. And if spiritual gifts begin to come among you, I understand that since I've been gone that people have moved in here from different parts of the country to make this their home. I'm thankful, grateful to God that I believe that the morning when I dedicated and laid that cornerstone there as a young man, I prayed for it standing to see the coming of Jesus Christ. Amen. And when I did, owing thousands of dollars, and there, you could take up an offering in a congregation this size and get 30 or 40 cents. And our obligation was somewhat $150, $200 a month. How could I ever do it? And I know that I was working and I would pay it off. I, 17 years of pastoral without taking one cent, but giving everything that I had myself outside my living and all that come into the little box on the back to the kingdom of God. And people prophesied and predicted that within a year's time it would be turned into a garage. Satan tried to take it away for one time in a flaw and a fraud of a lawsuit. Some man claimed he hurt his foot while he's working on it and then let it go and then and sued and wanted to take the tabernacle. And for weeks I stood at the post. But in spite of all the misunderstandings and the predictions and what they said, she stands today as one of the prettiest auditoriums and the finest churches there is in the United States. Amen. Right. From here has went the word of the living God. Amen. Around the world. See, around the world is constantly taking its circle around the globe from every nation under heaven. As far as Amen. Around and around the world. Let us be thankful for this. Amen. Let us be grateful for this. And now that we have a place to dwell in, a roof under our head, a clean, nice church to set in, let's dedicate ourselves newly to the task and consecrate ourselves to Christ. Amen. And Brother Neville, our noble brother, real pastor, servant of the living God, as far as that man knows the message, he holds with it with all he's got. Amen. That's right. He's a gentle person. He's a little uh, afraid to, or not afraid, I don't mean that, but he's so so awful gentle. He just a, doesn't speak out, you know, like to, to say a thing that's sharp and cutting or sit down or keep still. Uh, I've noticed that. Listen to the tapes behind it. But... It so happens that I can do that. So uh, uh, I, I want you to remember my words, you see. And this is all being taped. See? Everything is taped. And please let every deacon stand to his post of duty and remember that you're under a commission from God to hold that post sacred. See? Every trustee the same. Pastor is to bring forth... It isn't the pastor's place to have to say that. It's the trustees, are, I mean the deacons, for they are the police of the church. Amen. That is, if young couples come on the outside and blow horns, and you know how they usually do, or something like that at meetings, or uh, get out there and mother sends her girl down here and she takes off out with some uh, renegade kid and run out there in a car and her mother thinks she's in church like that, a deacon or see to that, you either come in here and sit down or I'm going to take you in my car and take you home to your mother. See? You, you must do that. Remember, love is corrective. Amen. Always Amen. genuine love is corrective. So you must be able to stand the correction. And mothers know now that there's a place there for your babies. 
you young kids no different than to run around over the village, see? And uh, you had us no different than to talk and carry on your conversations in the auditorium, see? Don't do that. It's wrong. It isn't pleasing to God. Jesus said, it is written, my house shall be made a house of worship, prayer. I'll call the house of prayer of all Amen. nations. And they were buying and selling, and he plaited ropes and ran the people out of the auditorium. And we certainly don't want that to happen in this sanctuary here. So let's dedicate our lives, our church, our tasks, our service, and everything we have to the kingdom of God. Amen. Now, now I want to read some scriptures before we have the dedicational prayer. And, um, and then it's just a rededication because real dedication happened 30 years ago. Now, and uh, then, uh, then as we, uh, we read this uh, scripture and talk on it for a few minutes, I trust that God will bring his blessings to us. And now, uh, there was another thing I was going to say. Yes, where we used to have the recorders and so forth, we got a regular room there where those who wants to take recordings, this special hookups and everything there that comes directly from the main mic in there. There's rooms, robes, everything for baptismal service. And then one thing, many people has always uh, felt bad at me, many people who really didn't know the scripture, about having a crucifix in a church. I remember one time, oh, something happened here about that. I had a, three crosses and a brother got all shook up because he heard a, another denomination say that a crucifix well, it meant Catholic. I want some student or somebody or some born-again Christian to say that Catholics has got the option on the crucifix. <laughs> crucifix of Christ doesn't represent Catholicism. That represents God, the kingdom. Now, saints represent Catholicism. We believe there's one mediator between God and man, and that's Christ. Amen. But Catholics believe in all kinds of mediators, thousands of women and man and everything. Uh, any good Catholic almost that dies becomes an intercessor. Now, crucifix of Christ represents Jesus Christ. Did you know the early Christians, according to the the ancient history of the early church, they carried crosses on their backs wherever they went to signify and identify themselves as Christians. Now, the Catholics claimed that with them. Of course, they claimed they was the first ones, but the Catholic Church wasn't even organized then. Okay. But Christians packed the cross on their... You've heard people say cross back. You refer that to Catholic? It is the real Catholic. The universal Holy Ghost Church of the world. Amen. It's correct. We are Catholic. Amen. We are the original Catholic. The Bible-believing Catholic. See? They are the church Catholic. The organization. We are free from that. We are the continuation of the doctrine of the apostles. We are the continuation of the baptism of the Holy Ghost and all the things that the early church stood for. And the Catholic Church has none of them. So they placed the crucifix here. It was brought, that was hewed out of olive trees under where Jesus prayed. That's a crucifix that taken years and was given to me by Brother Argenbright. And I want to dedicate it with this church. And how appropriate that ever who hung it there, I don't know who it was, and hang it here to my, to my left. He pardoned the thief to his right. That's me. And another thing it represents, as his head is bowed, as you see his suffering, any persons who are is looking over the altar, and he's expecting you here, sinner, he'll be looking down upon you. Later, they'll have a little light setting here that when the altar call is being made, a light will flash on to that. That when people are here to... You say, why do you need that? You shouldn't have an image 
Well, then the same God that said, don't make yourself any engraven images, the same God said, build two turbans and tip their wings together and put them at the mercy seat where the people pray. You see, it's, it's without understanding. So that is inspired and directly hung in its right place. And I'm so thankful to be the one at the right side. Uh, I trust that he has forgiven me for I, as far as literally stealing anything as I know, I never did in my life, but I've so misused his time till it stole that way and I've and done many things that I shouldn't do. And I'm grateful to God this morning that he has forgiven my sins. And now I want to read out of the book uh, First Chronicles 17, and just speak for about five minutes on dedicational service, pray, and then we're going into the message. Now, and First uh, Chronicles, the the seventeenth chapter. Night came to pass as David said in the house that. David said to Nathan the prophet, Lo, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of the covenant of the Lord remaineth under curtain. Then Nathan said unto David, Do all that is in thine heart, for God is with thee. And it came to pass the same night that the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David. Go, go and tell David, my servant, rather. Thus saith the Lord, Thou shalt not build me a house to dwell in, for I have not dwelt in a house since the day that I brought up Israel unto this day, but have gone from tent to tent, and from one tabernacle to another. Whereas I have walked with all Israel, spake I a word to any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to feed my people, saying, Why have you not built me a house? Now therefore, thus sh shalt thou say unto David, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep coat, even from fallen the sheep, that thou shouldest be ruler over my people Israel. And I have been with thee wheresoever thou hast walked, and have cut off thine enemies from before thee, and have made thee a name like the name of great men that are in the earth. I would like to say at this place that, that David saw the same thing that we saw. David said, It is not right that you people have built me a house of cedar, and the ark of the covenant of my God is still under curtains. That was skins that had been sewed together of sheep and animals. He said, It isn't right for me to have a nice home and the ark of the covenant of my God remaining in a tent. So God put upon his heart to build a tabernacle. But David, being a, a man of, of love and consecration to God, yet he had shed too much blood. So he said, David speaking this in the presence of the prophet of that age, which was Nathan. And Nathan, knowing that God loved David, he said, David, do all that's in your heart, for God is with thee. What a statement. Do all that's in your heart, for God is with you. And that same night, showing the consecration of David to the love of God, and then to see the same night knowing that he was in 
the error that he was not permitted to do it, God was graceful enough to come down and speak to Nathan. And I always liked these words. Go tell Nathan, my, uh, go tell David, my servant, that I took you from the sheep coat. Just, you wasn't nothing. I, I'd like to apply that to here just a minute. I took you from nothing. And I, I, I give you a name. You've got a name like great man that's in the earth. And I'd like to apply that in a, in a confidential, yet in a, a way of making a point. I was thinking that a few years ago, I, standing down in the city here and Nobody cared for me. Nobody loved me. I loved people, but nobody loved me because of the background of the family. No disregards to my precious mother and father. How I wish that Mama could have lived to walk in this sanctuary this morning. Many of the old timers who place their money to help build it here. Maybe God this morning will let them look over the banished chair. But the family of Branham didn't have a very good name around here on account of drinking. Nobody had nothing to do with me. I remember telling my wife not long ago, just remember that I, I couldn't get anyone to talk to me. Nobody cared for me. Now I have to hide to get a little rest. And now the Lord has given us this great place and, and these great things that he's done. And <clears throat> he gave me a, besides a, a bad name, he gave me a name. <laughs> Likened to some of the great men. And he's cut off my enemies wherever I went. There's never been nothing standing before it wherever it went. But, and how grateful I am for that. And how would I ever know as a little ragged kid up here two or three blocks from here to the Ingerville School when I was a laughing stock of the school from being so ragged skate on an old pond. How did I ever know that down beneath that pond lay the seed of a lily that could bloom like this? And how did I ever know that no one talking to me and yet he would give me a, a name that would be honored amongst his people? And now, David was not permitted to build the temple. He could not do it. But he said, I'll raise up from your seed, and he will build the temple. And that temple will be an everlasting temple. And upon your son... The son of David will be an everlasting kingdom he'll control. Solomon, David's son in the natural, from his natural strength, built a house unto the Lord, a temple. But when the real seed of David come, the son of David, he told him there would come a time that there wouldn't be one stone left upon the other of that temple. But he tried to point them to another temple. John the Revelator over in the book of Revelations, he saw this tabernacle, Revelations 21. He saw the new temple coming, descending down from heaven. 
adored as a bride was adored for her husband. And a voice out of the temple said, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with man. And God shall be with them. And they'll wipe all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more hunger, or no more sorrow, no more pain or death. Amen. For the former things have passed away. Amen. Then the true Son of David, as we're going to see in this lessons coming on in this week, will then come to his temple, the temple of God, the real tabernacle, which he has gone away to construct now. For he said in John 14, In my Father's house are many mansions, and I will go. What did he mean by that? is already foreordained, and I'll go to prepare a place for you and will return back to receive you to myself. Amen. And of course, we know that'll be in the great age to come. And the true seed of David will take the throne, which is Jesus Christ, and there will reign over the church as his bride, in the house with him and over the 12 tribes of Israel throughout all eternity. Amen. And these little places, as David could not build the true tabernacle of God because he wasn't prepared to do it. There was nothing he could do. He was a moral and shed blood. So is it today to us. We are not prepared to build the true tabernacle of God. There's only one can do that, and it's being in its construction now. But this little tabernacle, along with the temple at Solomon building, and along with the others, are only temporarily places of worship until the time comes when the real tabernacle will be set up upon the earth and righteousness shall reign from sky to sky and there will be no more sorrow. There will be no funerals preached in that tabernacle. There will be no more weddings for the wedding will be one great wedding for eternity. What a time that will be. But let us purpose in our heart today that in commemoration and waiting for that tabernacle to come, that we will so characterize ourselves by His Spirit that we will worship in this place as if we were in that other place, waiting for that place to come. Now let us stand to our feet. And as I read the Holy Script, and I saw a new heavens and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth was passed away, and there were no more sea. I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adored for a husband. And I heard the voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with man, and he shall dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Amen. Let us bow our heads now. Our heavenly Father, we stand in awe we stand in respect and in holy reverence. And we ask you, Lord, to accept our gift that you've given us grace, money, to prepare for a worship place for you. There's nothing or no place that we could prepare upon the earth 
that would be worthy for the, the Spirit of God to dwell in, but we offer this to you as a token of our love and feelings toward you, Lord. And we thank you for all the things that you have done for us. And now the building and the grounds being dedicated long ago to the service, and we thank you for memories of what has been. And now, Lord God, as the vision broke through years ago expressing this, that I've seen in old buildings that the people once was in and they had been repaired and made new. And I was sent back across the river. Now, Lord God, creator of heavens and earth, we stand as the people of thy foe. We stand as the, 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 the people of thy kingdom. And with myself and the pastor and the church, the people, we dedicate this building to the service of the Almighty God. Through the name of Jesus Christ, His Son, for the service of God and for reverence and respect of God, and may the gospel so flow from this place that it will cause the world to come from the four corners of the globe to see the glory of God going forth from it. As thou hast done in the past, may the future be many times greater. Father, we... Now dedicate ourselves to the service, to the Word, with all that's in us. Lord, the congregation and the people, they dedicate themselves this morning to the hearing of the Word. And we as ministers dedicate ourselves to the preaching of the Word. To be instant, in season, out of season, reproving, rebuking with all long suffering, as it's written there in the cornerstone from 30 years ago. You said the time would come when people would not endure sound doctrine, but would heap for themselves teachers having itching ears and be turned from the truth to fable. Lord, as we have tried to Hold out the word to the people. May we be inspired and strengthened with a double effort, Lord, as a double portion of the Spirit strikes upon the place. May the Holy Spirit, as it was in the day of the dedication of the temple, when Solomon prayed, the Holy Spirit in the form of the pillar of fire and cloud came in the front door, rolled up around the cherubims, went over to the holy place, and there took its resting place. Oh, God, Solomon said, if thy people be in trouble anywhere, look to this holy place and pray then here from heaven. Lord, may the Holy Spirit this morning come in to every heart, every consecrated soul that's in here. And the Bible says that the glory of God was so great unto the ministers could not even minister for the glory of God. Oh, Lord God, let it repeat again. As we give ourselves to Thee with the church and dedication for service, and it is written, Ask, then you shall receive. Amen. And we commit ourselves with our offering of the church this morning to you for service, for the latter-day lights, for the evening time, lights that we might bring 
consolation and faith to the waiting people that's waiting for the coming of the bridegroom. The dress of bride and the gospel of Christ for the Lord Jesus to receive. This we dedicate myself, Brother Neville, and the congregation to the service of God in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. God bless you this morning. I think that couldn't be said any better. I don't think there was a better prayer to dedicate us this morning. So if the musicians would come, we'll have our first service. Now that we know how to behave ourselves, we know how to conduct ourselves, we know how to what we've come here for, we've come here that the bride of Jesus Christ may get ready and adorn for his soon appearing. God bless you. Brother Billy. Hallelujah. Amen. How many are happy to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Amen. How many are comfortable this morning? <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We certainly, and I know Brother David probably killed me for this, but we want to thank a pastor with a vision who had a vision to build a house of God for us to be in the one group. And, and it was not without challenges, but he pressed on and the people supported, and here we are. So we certainly want to thank God for that. Amen. Amen. So we thank him. We thank God for having a pastor who has a vision, and, and we want to pray that the Lord will continue to reveal himself to him so we can move forward. Let's all stand this morning and read our Psalms. <clears throat> uh, we're going to read Psalm 84. Um, it just uh, came to my heart this morning. Um, I'll read the first verse, and then the congregation will read the second. I'll read the third, you'll read the fourth, and then we'll read together the last. Amen. And the title of it is Longing for a Sanctuary. How many were longing for a sanctuary? Amen. It says, How amiable are thy tabernacle, O Lord of hosts. Yea, the sparrow had found an house, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young, even the, thine altar, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed is the man whose strength is in thee, and whose hearts are, are the ways of them. They go from strength to strength. Every one of them in Zion appears before God. Behold, O God, our shield, and look upon the face of thine anointed. For the Lord God is the sun and the shield of the Lord will give grace and glory. No good things will be in will be behold from them that walketh upright. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusted in thee. Amen. Why don't you turn around and welcome someone this morning? Amen. 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 God bless you. May have your seats. Oh, would you be free from your burden of sin? 
There's power in the black, oh, and power in the black. Oh, in the blood. Oh, there is power. Oh, in the precious blood of the Lamb. Oh, and the world should be wide. Oh, much wider than so. There's power in the blood. Well, and there's wonderful power. Oh, hallelujah, there is power. Oh, in the blood of the Lamb. Oh, there is power. Oh, in the precious.
lift him up this morning. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Amen, Brother Jose, if you can come and help me sing uh, one or two songs. Amen. Amen. How many are excited, brothers, to, to be here, right? I think that the Lord has been so good. Let's sing, uh, there will be a uh, celebration, the Feast of the Overcomers. And it's so nice to see you all sitting in, the, uh, in, in this room all together, brothers. We're in a heavenly celebration. Is the glorious union the united bride from every nation? The redeemed Church of Jesus Christ, the feast of the great overcomers. I will not let it pass it by. A new song the bride of Christ is singing. Let the redeemed shout and praise the Lord. We're in a heavenly celebration. Is this union the united bride from every nation? The Church of Jesus Christ, the feast of the great overcomers. I will not let it pass me by. The bride of Christ is singing. Let the redeemed shout and praise the Lord. Y habrá en el cielo una gran fiesta. Será una gloriosa reunión. Se reunirán de todas partes los redimidos del Señor. Cantarán canciones de alegría. Lágrimas de gozo llorarán, será una fiesta de victoria. Solo los redimidos estarán, la fiesta de los vencedores. No me la voy a perder. Con alegría cantaré la fiesta de los vencedores. No me la voy a perder. El canto de los redimidos. Con alegría cantaré y habrá en el cielo. Una gran fiesta será una gloriosa reunión. Se reunirán de toda raza los redimidos del Señor. Cantarán canciones de alegría. Lágrimas de gozo llorarán, será una fiesta de victoria. Solo los redimidos estarán, la fiesta de los vencedores. No me la voy a perder. Redimidos con alegría 
cantaré la fiesta de los vencedores no me la voy a perder el canto de los redimidos con alegría cantaré con alegría cantaré No hay nadie, nadie como Cristo No hay nadie, nadie como Él No hay nadie, nadie como Cristo No hay nadie, nadie como Él Busqué y busqué y no encontré por todos lados y no encontré corrí, corrí y no encontré no hay nadie, nadie como él there is no one, there is no one like Jesus there is no one, there is no one like Jesus There is no one, there is no one like Jesus. There is no one, there is no one like Him. I look around, I found no one. I search around, I found no one. I walk around, I found no one. There is no one, there is no one like Him. There is no one, there is no one like Jesus. There is no one, there is no one like Him. There is no one, there is no one like Jesus. There is no one, there is no one like Him. I look around, I find no one, I search around, I find no one, I walk around, I find no one, there is no one, there is no one like him. Mocote a coca y Mocote a coca ni nadie, mocote a coca ni nadie, asa, asa, lite, no hay nadie, no hay nadie, nadie como Cristo, no hay nadie, nadie como Él. No hay nadie, nadie como Cristo. No hay nadie, nadie como Él. Busqué y busqué y no encontré por todos lados y no encontré. Corrí, corrí y no encontré. No hay nadie, nadie como él. Someone like him. Amen. Amen. Since the beginning, there's never been anyone like him. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I know there was a lot of uh, uh, specials that were, uh, song specials that were submitted. Uh, just uh, when I... Uh, apologize and say because of time we're going to just have a few this morning and if you can uh, uh, just hold on you can sing tonight so we'll certainly be happy to hear from you amen <laughs> but the author has a special this morning uh, the uh, 14th was his 60th birthday so 
uh, certainly thankful to the Lord, and he had a song in his heart and wanted to sing, so I want to invite him at this time. Amen. C'est une grâce et un privilège pour moi. It's a grace and a privilege for me. Bon, euh, cette semaine ici, euh, le mercredi passé, c'était mon anniversaire. Uh, this last week on Wednesday was my birthday. Bon, j'ai eu à accomplir 60 ans de vie. I, I have a 60, 60 years of life. C'est pas un mérite. It's not a merit. C'est la grâce de l'Éternel. Moi-même, je ne me retrouve pas à avoir vécu ces 60 ans. Um, I, I still couldn't, I can't believe, don't know how I got to 60. Mais je peux seulement me souvenir des événements dans ma vie. I can only remember events in my life. Bon, pour cela, je dis gloire à Dieu. For that, I say glory to God. J'ai un cantique. I have a, a, a song. Beaucoup d'entre okay. nous ici connaissent les cantiques. Uh, many of you knows it. Pour ceux qui parlent français, certainement. Uh, those that speak French. Uh, le titre du cantique, c'est « Jésus par ton sang précieux uh, ». The title is « Jesus by your precious blood ». Ok, c'est juste une reconnaissance à l'éternel. It's just a, uh, uh, just a, a recognition or thanksgiving to God. Pour ce qu'il a fait dans ma vie. For what he's done in my life. Et dans la vie de tout un chacun And de nous. And in the life of each one of us. Bon, je veux juste expliquer puisque je ne veux pas être égoïste. Uh, I want to explain because I don't want to be selfish. Bon, ça veut dire ceci. Euh, Jésus, ton sang, moi le pécheur. Me as a sinner. Et vous autres aussi. And you as a sinner. Nous étions dans le monde ne connaissant pas Dieu. We were in the world not knowing God. Nous nous sommes butés à beaucoup de difficultés. We find that we came, came across a lot of difficulties. Euh, Près même à perdre la vie. Yeah, even close to losing life. Nous pensions chercher Dieu. Uh, we were, we thought we were seeking God. Non, mais c'est Dieu qui nous a cherché. But it was God who was seeking after us. Quand il nous a retrouvés, when he, when he found us, nous nous avons exprimé le désir d'abandonner le péché. We have ex we, we, we expressed the desire to abandon sin. Par son sang précieux, il nous a lavé. By his precious blood, he washed us. Il nous a pardonné. And he forgave us. Bon, maintenant. Le sang de Jésus, the blood of Jesus, qui est la parole aujourd'hui, quand nous l'appliquons dans notre vie, when we apply it in our lives, pas sur notre corps, not on our bodies, à l'intérieur dans le cœur, à partir du cœur, from the heart, le sang lave tous les désirs du péché, the blood washes all the desires of the world, de l'intérieur à l'extérieur, from the inside to the outside. Donc, nous qui marchons échec en échec I walking from failure to failure. because le sang est entré en nous nous a lavé nous a rendu purs because the blood came into us and washed us and made us pure nous pouvons marcher dans la victoire maintenant now we can walk in victory sachant qu'il est avec nous knowing that he's with us et rendant gloire à son temps and bon. giving glory to his name chaque jour de notre vie every day of our lives que Dieu vous bénisse may God bless you Jésus par ton sang précieux enlevé mon iniquité Regarde-moi, dis au oh de Dieu Dis-moi que tu m'as pardonné j'ai longtemps erré, que rebelle, elle est, mais j'entends ta voix qui m'appelle, elle est, alléluia, au pied de ta croix, maintenant, en tout confit, brisé, je me rends, je suis blanc, plus blanc, Blanc, plus blanc, plus blanc, 
que la neige la vera le sale la gloire je serai plus blanc que la neige agneau blanc plus blanc blanc plus blanc que la neige alléluia blanc plus blanc que la neige Dieu très saint et trop grand pour moi Je vais en être délivré À cette heure où révèle-toi Jésus vient, sois ma délivrance Tu peux calmer ma souffrance au pied de ta croix maintenant. Tout confé brisé, je me rends agneau blanc, plus blanc, blanc, plus blanc, et j'ai. Jésus, ton sang précieux, à la vie, mon inégalité. Oui, tu m'as répondu de ce ton amour m'a tout pardonné. J'étais content. Blanc, plus blanc, blanc, 
Aren't you thankful for the blood? Amen. Amen. It's able to wash you and make you clean. Amen. Amen. We have a lot of uh, uh, requests up here. I'd like to go through them. Um, um, I have an announcement from the deacon that said, if you like to, uh, would like uh, uh, for some brothers to stay behind and help uh, fill out the uh, buckets uh, for the foot washing. I said, we need help tonight for the service. Amen. Uh, we have uh, uh, communion service tonight, so those that can help, please stay behind. Amen. Uh, Sister Gail writes, greeting saints, I'd like to take a moment to give thanks for the years I've been diagnosed or misdiagnosed with asthma and the COPD. I've had, a serious, I've had serious trouble breathing uh, with heaviness and pressing on my chest that I couldn't even walk much or, or vacuum without the respiratory problem. It said, uh, she writes, recently when I couldn't bear it anymore, I decided to walk up to the altar after a sermon uh, uh, is preached and I asked uh, the Pastor David to pray for my breathing problems, knowing that uh, the saints will join in, the pra in a prayer of the faith with us. It says, well, praise the Lord. Well, we get what we expect in the sense, in the sense, it says, and since the Lord Jesus touched and healed the breathing problem for a couple of weeks now, it said, I can breathe without even taking medication. It says, I was taking the medication that I was taking to help only for a few hours. It says, I don't even need to take medicine anymore and I can breathe on my own. It says, She writes, I have it no more. Jesus Jehovah Rapha, my healer, has healed me. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Isn't it wonderful to be healed by him? Yes. Amen. Amen. It is another one here. It says, Sister Jeannie Kubaluka would like to thank God for preserving her, both her and her daughter's life when she... Um, uh, um, when she truly uh, got rear-ended yesterday. Amen. She was in a car accident, and we certainly thank the Lord that everything went well. And she's here to, amen, as a testimony of the keeping power of God. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Sister Yamileth writes, God bless you, brothers and sisters. I want to thank the Lord and each one of you for your prayers. It says, I ask uh, for help. Uh, to continue to pray uh, for the healthy pregnancy and that God will be, be done throughout the process. Amen. Amen. Brother uh, Joseph uh, Dodi Kabwe and his wife, Sister uh, Sephora Nadine, they write, it says, it says, we thank the Lord for his assistance and healing that he's given my wife and I. It says, just after uh, I went through the uh, catheterization process, my wife was admitted in the intensive care and hospitalized for 10 days. But with the prayers of the saints, they finally found what was wrong with her. Uh, she's now feeling better and she was released from the hospital. Thank you saints for your prayers and to God be the glory. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Sister Melinda writes, please pray for our grandson Everett. Uh, he's been running fever for three days, trusting God's healing hand upon him. Amen. It's the same God this morning. Amen. Brother Crystal writes, I'm requesting prayer for my life and my family when I remember them. Sister Rebecca writes, Sister Maxine has muscular degener de degeneration and, has, uh, and is a spread to uh, both her eyes. And she's getting shots in her eyes on, on Tuesday and would like to be remembered in your prayers. Amen. We're going to pray that certainly the Lord can heal. The same God that healed the others is the same. Sister Magda writes, God bless you, saints. I ask for prayer for my young, uh, my young sister named uh, Pertila, Pertita, uh, who uh, says, who tomorrow will have treatment for her heart. It says, God be with her. Amen. And there was an email sent out by Sister uh, Peace, she writes, please remember my daughter in prayer. Uh, she's passing through challenges, challenging situation and uh, you want mercy and the compassion of the Lord will be upon her. And as it says that it may take the glory, God bless you, Sister Peace. Amen. This morning, if you have a need upon your heart, 
Hallelujah. We have so much to be thankful for. God working in the midst of his people, fulfilling his word every day. We can come here and raise our hand and say, certainly that same God is here this morning to hear my prayer. Amen. The brothers that are taking the offerings, if you could come. Brother Matthew, if you could just come and take these needs before the Lord. Amen. Lord Jesus, we are just so thankful there's a place that we can come and be able to approach you, a provided place by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, as we've read the needs of your people, <clears throat> many needs, great needs, Lord, my heart went to the scriptures of how David was once in a time of great need when the enemy had taken everything, burnt down the homes and taken the wife and the children. And the scripture says he encouraged himself in the Lord. Lord, we read the testimonies before the needs and it brought an encouragement, Lord, to see how you've moved on behalf of your people once again because you are the Lord God that heals all of our diseases. Lord, you've moved on our behalf time and time again. This, there's a house full of miracles this morning. Lord, you've brought us from all over the globe and each one represented here is a miracle of your grace and your love and the blood that you shed on Calvary and the stripes that you took on our behalf, Lord. That means we can stand here victorious in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can speak to the needs that are represented here, Lord. Because you are on record for healing. You are on record for saving. You are on record for delivering, Lord. And so now on behalf of all these needs, Lord, we commit them to you once again, Lord. And we're looking forward to the testimonies to come forth over this pulpit, Lord. Because you're a God who's more than able. Lord, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for what you are doing amongst us. We pray for the tithes and offerings, Lord. May you bless those that can give, those that can't give, and may it be used to further your kingdom and thy glory. We ask all these blessings and thank you in the most wonderful name, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh God, oh make a way where the sin Oh, and it works in way, oh, and we cannot see, He will make a way for me, He will be my God, oh, me Sing that as the choir comes. That cost so. Oh, and I paid my way.
and mercy let healing and redemption find searching souls Lord have your way we humbly pray this is your house, 
this is your house, Lord. Come and dwell here. This is your house. The holy house of prayer. It's where the lost and the lonely. come not just dwell in the physical tabernacle but a tabernacle of our souls amen amen sister Rebecca Crowley and the friends have a special amen if they could come at this time Yeah. 
Amen. Why don't we sing, God is so good. Amen. Hallelujah. God is so good. God is so
gracious Father, you're so worthy. Father, as we heard our messenger say, we've dedicated this place as a place of worship, a place that we come to hear from you, not to talk, Father, but to listen, to bring our thanksgivings and our requests. But Father, above all that we ask, we want you to know that you're worthy. You're the King of kings, you're the Lord of lords. We praise you as creator and maker of all heavens and earth. All things that were made were made by you. And nothing that was made, Father, there's nothing that's made that was not made of you. You are Lord, you are God. We have not words to describe your majesty and your glory, but we praise you this morning. Father, now we've come that you might speak to us that you might deal with our hearts, Father, that our lives might turn from darkness to light. Father, that we might come running to you, that the backslider might re-examine his position. Father, we may be rededicated this morning. We ask you to move in our midst and speak to our hearts. We ask it in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May God bless you. You may be seated. It's nice to have everybody here with us this morning. I think they told me that we ended up with a little over 400 people here this morning, and that's a nice crowd. Uh, this evening, we'll have communion with the believers uh, at communion. No, that's when the real church comes out. You have the Sunday church, and then you have the real church. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that, you know, Brother Bram said that, uh, uh, he was one of those guys that can sit down and, and well, I'm one of those preachers that can s say what we need, you know what I mean? Cause, so I, I, we're not trying to win friends, but we're trying to serve God. Amen. And so we, we, we just encourage you. Another thing I'd like to encourage everybody to do is I'd like you to treat church like work. How many comes late to work a half hour, 45 minutes late? You know, I really think it, it's a tremendous insult to the Lord that we make it the church, uh, our work on time to get something that's carnal. And yet we roll into the house of God 35, 45 minutes late and expect his spirit to move. Amen. So I want to say that because I, I, I want to sh share with you this morning what I stand for and what it is that I preach from this pulpit. And, and I'm not perfect. You know, I'm late occasionally myself. In fact, Brother Bram said that he was always late. They said that they called him the late William Brown. But that was because he was about God's business. You know, have an interview or have a vision or be praying for somebody, you know, about God's business. Sometimes I, I, I wonder what it is that we hold dearest. You know, what our priority is and what it is that we, we hold dear to ourselves. And I think that reflects a lot sometimes. And so try to police everything, as we heard Brother Bram said, they're the policemen uh, of the church. And it, it's very difficult for them uh, when everybody co comes late and comes pouring in late. And of course, many of you that know me say, I don't believe in culture. You know what I believe? I don't, I don't believe there's cultures that allow anybody to break the word of God. Uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer of that, that culture's taught. And the reason people are late because they're taught to be late. You know, the reason people don't work is because they're taught not to work. You know, they were taught those things, but 
We're, we're not here today. We're here to only for one purpose, and that is to be taught by the Word of God. This is our, our, our preeminence. This is what everything that is to be stand for. And uh, I, I'm trying to look out. You know, there's always certain people I look for. So, and my congregation's kind of moved all over the place. So, uh, I, you know, I'm trying to find many of you and uh, do fellowship with you. But um, the prophet of God made a statement. He said, when the church is in order, and everybody comes in and they're praying and they're, they've came in and they've read their Bible. He says, and the minister comes out, he says, God's fixing to move. And so it's real important. So uh, that's why I, I, I'm saying that's important to uh, come into your post of duty and be there, that God can really do something. And, and it's like anything that's new, there's all kinds of little, um, what do they call that word? Uh, tweaking, is that a correct word? Where you, you have to adjust this a little and adjust that a little, and uh, pretty soon we'll get it all together. Uh, we've started now to uh, work on our fellowship hall next door. So until that's ready, uh, we're gonna use it for foot washing for the sisters, but uh, we just advise everybody just to probably stay out of that part of the church, if you could. And, and, and do the best you can to uh, adhere to the things that our prophet told us this morning. Amen. Let us stand this morning. We, and let's turn in our Bibles, if we could, to the Gospel of St. John. And the first chapter in the first verse and we'll read a couple of verses here this morning and it says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God Amen. and the same was in the beginning with God all things were made by him. All things were made by the word. Nothing came into existence until it was spoken. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And in him was life, and the life was in, and, and the life was the light. Of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. Heavenly Father, we ask you to bless your word. In your precious name we pray. Amen. God bless you. We certainly uh, welcome any visitors and those of you that have come this morning to share our first service with us. When we were reading and listening this morning, there was a statement that made that kind of uh, stood out to me, uh, especially, and I, I will read it to you. Uh, he says, let's dedicate this to God. This is his meeting place where we meet with him. Now, th this is a statement that struck me. And the law goes forth from the sanctuary, of course. And I believe that that would be pleasing to our Heavenly Father. And he made that statement, and I, 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 it struck my heart in a different way because we have such a... Uh, certain ideas in our mind of what words mean and of what uh, uh, we categorize things, if I could say it that way. And so a lot of times when we hear the word law, the prophet of God says the law goes forth from here. So the law of God goes forth from the pulpit, from the word of God. He says this is where we come to meet him and this is where the law goes forth. 
But a lot of times in our heart, we think the law automatically means uh, that it's a, a set of rules or it, it, it's the Old Testament. It, it, it's uh, the way that they used to worship and it was the things they used to do. The washing of pans, the, uh, the not working on the Sabbath, all the different ways that they dressed and everything. And so the minute we, we, we hear the word law, we think, oh, a, a something that is a, a, a put upon us, you know, and we talk about it in the scriptures, the law of sin and death, and that man didn't know what sin was until the law came. And, and so our, our thinking is of the law is thou shalt not. Thou shalt not commit adultery. A man didn't know he could run after, maybe by his nature, he would go and maybe uh, run uh, and, and freely. But then the law came and said, if you're married, then you don't do these things outside the holy covenant of marriage. You don't commit adultery. Now, to break that law to him then became sin. You know, uh, a, a lot of people, maybe they would find something uh, on the road or they would find something or they saw something that they felt that they needed and somebody else didn't need. And so they would go take it from them and they could say, okay, uh, and they didn't, they didn't know. They, every man lived unto himself according to his own measure, uh, according to his own righteousness. And so I might take something, and I didn't know that was wrong until the law came and said, thou shalt not steal. And then you, and maybe you wanted what somebody else had. And then the law comes and says, thou shalt not covet. You know, so the law began to govern. So there, there was a, 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 the law of sin and death is the law that governed sin. So the law governed sin. It kept man's actions into a place that he wouldn't sin. So the law of sin and death, that law of God was uh, uh, the, the law of sin or the law of death. It, it governed the sinful nature of man by law. And, and that was necessary. But there's another law. And I would just, if I could uh, just share with you this morning, maybe uh, from my own thinking, uh, there's another law that goes forth. And, and there's the law of the word. And you say, well, what's the law of the word? Well, the law of the word is it never fails and it never changes. That's a law. That it never, that, uh, that's something that you can live by. And that's the, how we stay in order in society as we live by laws and rules. And we know those laws and rules, and therefore we know what to expect. And, and then we have people that, that uh, uh, police those laws and rules. And if someone is uh, breaking the rules and breaking the laws, and then we apprehend that person, and, and uh, we try to end the disruption. And, uh, and so we have a disruptor as Christians. How many knows who our disruptor is? It's the devil. You know, that's all he wants to do is disrupt the order of God and disrupt the word of God. That's what he does. That's the whole thing that Satan wants to do is he wants to discredit the word of God. He wants to make the word of God of none effect. He doesn't want all of us to ever come to the realization that the word is unchanging and it's always true. There's one thing you can count on is you can count on the word of God. If you read it 50 years from now, it'll say the same thing. If, you, if the people that were reading it 100 years ago were reading the same thing. So it doesn't change. And God doesn't change. He doesn't change. So we know that that's a... The, uh, a, law, uh, a, a, a law of God, that he's an unchanging God. If he ever does one thing one way, he'll continue to do it the same way every time. You can count on that. That's why testimony is so important for a believer, is because it allows them to hear what God did for somebody. 
And then that person can say, if that person did that, if God did that for them, he can do that for me. Because he's the same. Yes. And when that person says, I, I read this promise in the Word of God, and I stood on this promise, and I believe this promise, and that promise comes to pass, you can sit back and know that there's hope in the camp. There's life in the camp because there's the Word up in the camp. And where there's Word, there's life. Because this is the light of men, and it's the life of men. And the Word of God is the life of men. Okay, and so we have that law. So what goes forth from the house of God is the law. But it's not the Ten Commandments law. It's not the law uh, that the children of Israel lived under. It's the Gentile law of grace. And that law is that we have the word. We have an unfailing promise that God keeps his word. And if we live by that word and we walk in that word, that word promises us it will produce word. And so we can rest there. Uh, it's a resting place for the believer that it, it doesn't change with time. It, it doesn't change with morals. It, 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 as the world falls apart, the believer doesn't have to fall apart. In fact, that's a time that the believer needs to take the Word of God and cling to it ever so more. Because it's the, the Word of God. And so that's a law that is brought forth. And there's another law that we've been talking on, the law of the seed. But... And we, we know the law of the seed. So when God created heaven and earth and he said, let there be, he created it by his word. The heavens and earth were framed by the word of God. So there was nothing in the beginning but God. God had thoughts and then God expressed those thoughts and he said, let there be light and there was. Nobody knew what light was. If we were on the other side of it, this is part of the law of the word, that God is his own interpreter. He interprets the word. So if I said, let there be light, well, you wouldn't know what I was talking about or what light was until light appeared. So, for example, if you had never seen a piano or you had never seen an organ, you, you have no idea. In fact, that word hadn't even registered in your mind that you could make an association. And I said, let there be a piano and organ. Well, you would have to sit back and wait for what that I spoke to materialize and manifest before you could make the interpretation and have the revelation of what it is. The trouble with men is God says something and then they all start piping in their two cents. This is what I think an organ is. And we got one guy walking around here saying, organ, organ, piano, piano. Another guy's going, piano, piano, piano. But God's his own interpreter. And God chose to reveal his word by revelation. And that's the law. I can't change that. A group of men can get together and come up with a definition and say, we will decide it means this, or we will decide it will mean this, or I think this is what the people can understand. Let me tell you, a child can understand the Word of God. The Word of God doesn't change. God reveals the Word of God, and God interprets His Word by bringing it to pass. That is a law. That is the law that we want to preach from this pulpit is the law of God. The law of the Word of God. The law of the seed of God is that everything is going to bring forth of its own kind. When he created the trees, he said, let there be trees, let there be fruit, and let the seed be in it. He had a way that he was going to bring things to pass or bring things into existence. So he spoke them into existence, 
And after he spoke them into existence, the way that they were going to procreate themselves or continue was by seed. The apple tree drops its seed into the ground. The, every thing, I don't know all the uh, different ways that it comes forth, but we've all come forth by seed, by the plan of God, by the plan of mating. So we know that there's a law of the seed, and that seed is that everything brings forth of its own kind. Lies don't breed truth. Lies breed more lies. Lies produces lies. You might dress it up a little bit and make it look pretty and, and, and put a, a, a tuxedo on it and a top hat on it and uh, give it a, 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 a set of spats and you might say it, but it's a lie nonetheless. And the reason it was a lie, because it come from the lie. And Satan is a liar. He's the father of all lies and there's no truth in him. And anything that's contrary to the word of God is of the devil. I don't care if you put a robe on it. I don't care if you uh, put a crown on it. I don't care if you wrap a church around it. I don't care if you wrap music around it. I don't care how that you present it. You can put a religious covering on it. But if it's not the word of God, it's still the lie. That's the law of the seed. That it'll come forth of its own kind. It'll produce its own kind. It, it'll, it'll come out. It can, and we also know that within the law of the seed is the law of reaping and sowing. So all these things are laws that come forth because the law of God comes forth from the house of God. That's what our messenger was trying to tell us. That's what our messenger was trying to tell the church ages. That you just can't go make your own religion and think you're going to get to heaven. You've got to come God's provided way. There's no way around that. So it behooves us to examine ourselves and find out what law that we're living on. Are we living under the law of self-righteousness? Are we living under the law of our own conclusions? Are we living under the law of our own intelligence? A man told me one time, I'm going to examine the message and see if it's right. I said, the law of God is that I'll build my church upon revelation. Not conclusion. Not education. When you get a revelation from God, be true to it. If you're true to it, and there's error in it, God will correct, correct the error by the word. He'll not let you go astray if your heart is pure. So we we know that's a law. And we've been talking on the law of the sea. The law of the sea. And again this morning, I'm explaining to you where I stand in the gospel. What my vision is. What it is that I preach. And why that I preach it. I want you to have a full understanding. a, 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 A full disclosure to you why that I play tapes. Why did I do the things you ought to know? You have a right to know. Those of you that support the ministry and those of you that put their, your money into building this building, as our messenger mentioned, he, he said, you have a right to know. What is it that Brother McGeary believes? What's the, the core heart of what he stands for and how he thinks and what he believes? And why he goes the direction that he goes. And I'm going to be honest with you this morning. And share it why. So there, there's a, a, a law of revelation. We find it in Amos 3 and 7. And I'm putting these laws together to give just a little moment before I share with you my heart. And this is a law that I sincerely believe. For I'll do nothing unless I reveal it to my servants, the prophet. That's the law of revelation. That's how God chose to get a message to his people. That he would reveal it. Prophet spoke to God lip to ear. That's how they spoke to God. 
God spoke to them, and then they spoke. And, and so, in understanding those laws, I, and I'm not here to speak of myself this morning, but I, I, I want to share my heart with you of what I think and where I think that we are as a people and where I think that we are in the plan of God. And uh, you are entitled to completely different viewpoints. There's many people that believe that we're on the midst of a, a great revival. I don't believe that. Okay, I don't believe there's a great big gigantic revival coming to the church. Our messenger told us the revival's over. So we're not looking for what swept this country in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and through the 60s because there came a time when this country rejected the word of God. And he said that on every corner, they're crying, revival, revival. God's going to send a revival. God's going to raise up this nation. Oh, that just re reminds me when and the, the prophet come to up, Mike, and he says, oh, take these horns and go out and drive them from the land. And he said, isn't there one other? Yeah, yeah but that guy, we don't want to hear for him. He said, I saw Israel scattered as sheep, you know. And because he'd prophesied. So how's there going to be a revival when the seventh church age messenger said it was over that America had their revival? What most people think is the revival is going back to garlic. I don't want to go there. So we're, we're not looking for that. But we are looking for something that I think is the greatest opportunity that man has ever had. And I'd like to illustrate that in my own little way this morning and have you place yourself within this illustration. So we know that God has a word. And when God speaks his word, it will come to pass. Amen. Law of the word, right? Amen. It will not fail. It will come to pass. We also know that God never speaks anything unless he has an intention and a reason for doing it. There's no vain words in the gospel. There's no vain sentences in the message of the hour. There's no vain stories. You might think, well, those are corny stories. They're not corny for somebody that's laying on their deathbed. They're not corny for someone that's so desperate they can't find a way out. There's, they're not corny to somebody that doesn't even, uh, is so far away from religion and association with preachers that they have no hope, yet God knows what he's doing. Every word was spoken just for a reason and for a purpose. You can count on that. It, 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 there's no, and and the, the wonderful bar, part about the word of God is you take the whole of it. You don't take part of it. Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So cause that, cause that's what we live by. So when God spoke his word, he put it in seed form. And we know that he said that, he, that maybe some will plant it and water it, he says, but that he would plant it, he would water it, and he would raise it up by his spirit, saith the Lord. So we know that God it had planted a seed. And not only did he plant a seed in the natural sense, he planted a spiritual seed. All of you that are here this morning are here because there was something in you that called you. 
You say, well, I was just invited to hear. No, you received that invitation because something inside of you uh, connected. You might, you might dress it up and call it curiosity. Uh, you might try to put your, you know, your uh, uh, shades on, your sunglasses on that you might be identified, you know. Oh, I just come because I was curious. No, you came because there's something inside of you that's moving on you. Because God's moving. And God wants to take you from where you are to where that he wants you to be. That's what God does. That's what he wants. God is not against us. God's for us. Amen. If you're out in sin, he doesn't want you to live in sin. He wants you to know the joy and liberty that we have in Christ Jesus. He wants you to know the, the, the joy of salvation and, and what it means. That, that, that's what his heart, his heart is towards you. He loves you. His thoughts are good. He said, oh, if man could just understand the thoughts that I have for them, that they're good, they're pleasant, they're, they're blessings. So God does not want us to die in the trap of Satan. And Satan appears as an angel of light. Satan comes in a religious garment. Satan comes spewing lies out of his mouth and misinterpreting the word of God. And no matter how blessed you might feel that it is and what a great sensation it is, God is obligated to his word. That's the law. And God provided a way. And man can't come up with another way to get to God. They can't dress it better. They can't speak it better. They can't put it together better. God's provided the way. It was His Word. And He provides the way to man. I don't have a right to change it no matter how smart that I think I am. I don't have a right to go in here and put these scriptures together to make it say something it doesn't. The law of the word is God interprets his word and brings it to pass. But also the law of the church of Lady Osea is, I counsel thee to buy eye salve that thou might see. That you might see this word that's manifesting and coming to pass in this age. We're at the end time. Iraq fire, fires missiles at Israel. You talk about unstable. You don't know who's going to push what button. It, it, it's a time to be sincere. So, knowing these laws, it's important to see how that God works. And it's, it's very obvious right in front of us. Our messenger said God hides himself in simplicity and reveals himself in the same. So he, it's very simple what he does. It's so simple that it's happening right in broad daylight, right before our eyes, it's coming to pass. And if, if we don't have ISAB that we might see, in other words, we, you, you put salve in your eye to clean out all the stuff that's blocking your vision, to, to make your eye see clearly, to, so that you can focus. So he says, I give you eye salve, that you can get the junk out of your eyesight, that you can get the confusion out of your eyes, that, that your vision might cl come clear, and you might be able to see what it is that I'm really doing. How many wants that? I do. I, I want to know what he's doing. If I could place this in here, uh, I'll do nothing unless I reveal it first to my servant, the prophet. <coughs> Excuse me. I believe a prophet came in this age. Vindicated. Proof. Now, you might say, 
There's no way that you can't say he wasn't a prophet. Now you can say he was a false prophet. That's your own opinion if you would like to do that. But you can't say he wasn't a prophet. He saw things from behind. He saw things in the future. And he saw things present. There's only one person I know that's omnipresent like that, and that's God. And God does nothing until he reveals it first to his servant, the prophet. And we know that this messenger came to this age. There was a certain time in the calendar of God with a certain condition and a certain events to take place on this earth that this prophet would arrive in. I, we could go into the book of Revelations and talk about the four winds and the four corners and the angels starting that. But it, <coughs> it was all in this time that this messenger was to arrive on the scene. And we know the biggest signpost or flashing red light of the sign of this prophetic coming, of this visitation by the Lord Jesus Christ to his church through a prophet messenger was the condition of Lady Osea. He says, as it was in the days of Lady Osea, uh, I mean, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man as it was in the days of Sodom. So we understood that the signpost or the flashing red light to the believer to catch their attention, to apply the ISAB, is that when this world began to get in a Sodom condition, and I hope I don't have to go through the events that are taking place in our country now, to let you know you're in a Sodom condition. But that isn't for us to have an agreement. Oh, we're all in a... It's for us individually to consider our position in the kingdom of God at the time and moment that we're in. That's what we got to consider. I know what it's like to be a teenager and run with your buddies and... Uh, can you, you know, to hot rod down the road and to drink and to smoke and, you know, get high and listen to music and life's just a whirlwind. You know, the wages of sin is death. But God's got a gift for you and it's eternal life. And you don't want to walk away from that. I imagine there's people right in here that could testify this morning that God dealt with their heart, they walked away, and now they're thankful this morning to be alive. So it's, and it's an individual affair. And I hope this morning that you will purpose in your heart to dedicate your life to what is going to allow you to pass from this realm, this corrupt realm of this corruptible flesh, old, wrinkling, bone-aching body that's going to go into the ground and step over and into an eternal body, one that will live forever because the gift of God's eternal life. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! I want to do that. I want to make that transition. I, I want to come to that place that I can be raptured, that I can be translated. And may I use another word in relation to the seed, that I could be harvested. Because we know that the seed is harvested when it's mature and when it's ripened. And I'm going to close now in the next few moments to, with what that I want to speak. And I, I would like to use my favorite prop. 
uh, Benoit. <laughs> Benoit, I, I commission you to stand right there, and now you're a prophet. Okay. All right? Mm -hmm. So, I know Benoit doesn't look like this person on the outside, but I'm wanting him to look like that person on the inside. Okay, but this is for our illustration. Brother Brenham had a seed in him. He had to have a seed in him because of the law of seed. You say, well, he was a prophet. He was born to prophet. He had all the characteristics of a prophet. But yet that seed had to be brought to a certain place. First of all, he had to get his attention. How many know the price that the prophet of God paid for God to get his intent? Because of the work he had. He lost family members. He lost life. He was at the edge of a fall when he got down on his knees. He said, God, if you give me a chance to live, I'll never disobey you again. What do you think he was breaking up about and crying in that tape? As he thought back to that day, the price he paid losing his daughter Losing his wife. But yet the consolation that God gave him by seeing him on the other side. That's the kind of God we serve. Amen. So here's this little raggy kid we talked about that ended up having a name amongst all the saints of God throughout the world, the elected. The lady of sea and age and the lady of sea and bride knew that this prophet was their angel messenger. Mm -hmm. right. That he was an angel sent from God to deliver a message to them. Right. Okay? No other voice, no other way, a one man invasion. God could have had a committee, but God don't do it that way. He has a law. I will do nothing till I first reveal it to my servants, the prophet. Now, I've got to take this role in this little skit because I'm the narrator. Okay, but in this skit, I'm the word of God. Okay, now, here's my prophet, servant, William Branham, that Ben represents. Now, I've got a job for him to do. I've got a message for him to deliver. Because in my mind, I knew what he was in the beginning. But yet he's still in which form? Seed form. So we know that the word of God must first come to a prophet. So here's our, our messenger and the word of God starts coming to him. It comes to him in a burning bush. It comes to him in a shed. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. and it, come, it keeps coming to him in different ways. What's that word doing? It's transforming him uh -huh. into what that I had in mind for him. Yes. Now there's only one thing that's going to transform him. And that's what? The word. The word's the only thing that can bring him into what it was that was spoken. Right. 
Right? You know, many times I say this and people just sit back and look at me, but Jesus was a part of the bride. How else could he be a kinsman redeemer? The only difference was he wasn't born in sin, shaped in iniquity, and he didn't come into the world speaking lies. But yet he was tempted every way that we're tempted. He was tempted. He was a man, but yet God dwelt in him. And even he learned obedience by the things he suffered. I want you to understand, God can't break his line. Okay, so Jesus made this statement, right? I do nothing until the Father first shows me. Okay, he was the prophet of all prophets. He was the prophets that they all looked to. And he spoke lip to ear with the Father. Him and the Father were one. We're a little lower than that. I know some people don't think they are, but the reality is that we're way lower than that. So as God began to speak and show his prophet and reveal things to his prophet, the Godhead, water baptism, right? Remember the vision. He, he wondered about the rain falling on the just and the unjust. He was going through all this. And then he, he, he remembered and he saw the back of God and he, he, he saw the things raise up. All those things that he's sharing with you were things that God was sharing with him. Right. And the things that God was sharing with him were transforming him mm -hmm. into what that he was going to be. Right. I think our illustration set now. So now... So now, the Word of God is coming. It comes to the prophet, and now we find out that there came a time he was going to open the seals. Right? We, so we have the revelation of the Godhead, the revelation of serpent seed. All these revelations were first coming to him and transforming him and making him into what that he was. He, he didn't bypass the word to do it. But because of the law of, of the law of revelation, that God could do nothing unless he revealed it first to his servant, before he could get it to you, he had to give it to him. And it had to have the same effect on him that it would have on you. Else it's not the law of the word. So you understand? So here he is. He's living his life. And God's opening him his door here. He took him to a camp meeting, didn't he? Excuse me. To show, to show uh, one guy speaking in tongues and another guy. And one being honest and one being this. And, and, and he was going through all those things. And all those things were maturing him. Bringing him in to the ministry. Forming him into that son of man. Forming him in to that wave offering. That first seed that came to maturity. How many understands that? That by the word that was brought to him it brought him to maturity. And then that sheep offering was waved over the people. Now, so the same word that's coming to him is now because of the law of revelation. We're not getting the word secondhand. And it's not secondhand word. And it's not manhandled word. The same word that was spoken to him, he turned around and spoke it to us. The same word that brought him to maturity is the same word that's 
to bring the bride to maturity. It's the same word. It's the same message. Now, when, when that flock is, that, that thing in the harvest, in the wheats in the harvest, and he used those things for a purpose, you know, the wind would come. Has anybody ever seen the wind blow across a grain field? And how it all just folds down. And pretty soon it looks like waves just going across. It's a magnificent sight. And the wind would come. And the rain would come. And, they would, and, and the wind was a type of the move of the Spirit. And the move of the Spirit would come. And it would move. And the rain would come. It would be blessings. But that wasn't what brought the seed to maturity. It was the Word that brought the seed to maturity. It was the Word that he was seeing every day that was being revealed to him and transforming him to where he learned you can't do God a service without it being His will. All the th sermons you hear that He's preaching were the very things that made Him what He was. He didn't live apart from His Word. If you will allow me, that's why you can't separate the messenger from the message. He becomes the interpretation of the Word. Because now his life is a reflection of what God had in his mind. This is how I want my believers to live. This is how I want my believers to live. This is how I want my believers to know me. I want them to know I'm not three gods. I want them to know there's only one provided place of worship. I want them to know the, the things that, that I've showed you. I want you to speak them back to them that they too might become sons and daughters of God. It's not the wind that does it. And it's not the rain that does it. Though when the rain falls, praise God. But I don't want a major on rain. The wind is wonderful. It causes roots to grow. But we don't want to major on the wind. There's one thing that matures the bride... And that's the same word. Yes. Amen. Not a handled word. Not a second hand word. God gave it to his prophet. The prophet gave it to us. God did not pick a ministry, a fivefold ministry, any ministry, anywhere. To step in between you and that voice and say, this is what he meant. This is what he was trying to explain. Let me tell you what he was getting at. The word will do it by itself. It's the word that matures. And that's where I believe that the church is. Because we were told that she, what does she have to do now? She has to lie in the sun and ripen. She's got to come to maturity. She, she's got to come to that place. Now we know the word doesn't quicken. It's the Spirit that quickens. So God speaks His Word 
and the Spirit, by revelation, comes and makes that, what does quicken mean? To bring to life. To make alive. The Spirit comes to make the Word alive in you. Not the rain alive in you, not the wind alive in you, but to make the Word alive in you. That's what it does. The Spirit is not even to speak of itself, but to bring you into remembrance of all things that I said. To me, that's one of the best scriptures of an explanation of revelation that there is. I will, I will reveal it to you. All of us in here are on equal footing, in equal ground, because we all can hear the same voice and the same word. There's no big eyes. There's no little U's. The word will have the same effect on you. that it has on everybody. Don't matter where you come from. Doesn't matter if you grew up eating rice or you grew up eating tortillas or you grew up eating uh, weeds or whatever you call it. It don't matter. Don't matter what you ate. Didn't matter where you slept. Didn't matter. When the word strikes the seed. That seed will bring forth of its kind. My sheep hear my voice and another they won't follow. Oh, you say, Brother David, what it is. That's why I want you to know why my heart is so set on making that voice available to you. Why it's so important that you listen to the Word of God for the age. Because it's not second-hand Word. It's the same Word that He spoke to the prophet to take him from the sheepfold as he typed himself to where that he almost had to hide because his gift was so great. He just spoke it to us. It was lying right there in what we listened to. He said, he did that. His word did that. His word came to me and kept me from running down this road, running down that road. He preached it to us in the way of a true prophet. A prophet stays with what? The word. What word was he staying with? Not man's interpretation of word. Not the historical Bible teachings of other ages. Not the, not the conclusions that the nominations made. He was taking the word that was given to him from God. Lift ear. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. That was the word that transformed him. Where there wasn't devils that could stand in front of them. That could sit there and say, I take every spirit in this building in my control in the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, I love that. That head goes back. He's here. You can't hide now. You think he popped out of bed one morning? No. He sat under that word. That word. He sat in that presence. He let that word mold him. He let that word bring him to maturity. He let that word just take every ounce of his own desire 
out of him until he was molded into a son of God. So much so that he could stand up in our presence and say, who is this Melchizedek? Who is this God in this form standing in front of you today doing the same signs and the same wonders that were manifested before you? What caused that? The Word. The same Word that's on those tapes. The same Word that God gave Him, He turned around and gave us. And by the law of the Word, if that Word produced that Son, that same Word has to produce sons and daughters of God. If it doesn't, it breaks every law of God. If it doesn't have the same effect on you that it had on Him, it breaks every law of God. If, if it doesn't bring the seed fruit to maturity that was in that seed, and, and it doesn't bring the seed that's in you to maturity, then the law is broken. And that's one thing that Satan can't do, is he can't break the law of God. You say, Brother Davis, what's the, the desire of your heart? I don't desire fame. I can honestly say that to you. I don't desire popularity and I don't desire money. But the desire of my heart Amen. is that every one of you comes to the full maturity. As Brother James Hayes shared this scripture with me at a very crucial time in my life, he said, herein is the love of God manifest, that as he is, so are we in this world. That's what I want for our lives. That's what I want for the congregation. Those of you who have recently joined us, I don't want nonsense. I don't want other people's teachings. I don't want the way other people do things. I want us to listen, learn, and transform. That's as simple as I can put it. Because I heard a messenger say, you're little messiahs. You're little gods. The works that I do you will do also. And I asked myself, how did you do those works, Brother Branham? He did those works because he sat under that word. He was corrected. He, 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 he was so public with us about his mistakes, about his shortcomings, about his battles. Why? Because he wanted you to know the word that God was giving him would do the same thing for you. If you would listen to it and you would believe it, it will transform you and harvest you and make you into a harvestable, harvestable grain. And that's what it's about. It's not about going in and out of sin and in and out of the world. It's not about all your mental battles being one day up and one day now. That's all humanism. But if you stay in that word, that word will mature you. If you stay with that word, it will take the greenness out of you. If you stay with what he said, and you have an absolute of that word in your life, Amen. it will produce a rapture in you. Amen. And I don't know any other way to explain it to you this morning. I'm not an elegant preacher, I know that. 
I don't have the energy I had as a young man to run from one side of the stage to another. That's never produced anything. It's what's said, not how it's said. And I believe God showed us how it was to be said by how he spoke it to us. So we're here to mature in the revealed word of the hour as it was revealed to God's servant, the prophet, William Merriam Ranham. That word is our doctrine. That word is our truth. That word is our example. And you can't separate the messenger from the word. I never meant, Brother Branham, the privilege of meeting his sons and his daughters, his children, many of his associates and managers. You know, as much as I've enjoyed those times, none of them can ever do for you and to you other than what's on those tapes. You say, why do you preach then? Because on the tapes, he said to do it. And obedience is better than sacrifice. In closing, I'll say this. The word of God is what positions you. Nothing else positions you but the word. Because the word, and each of you here tapes, whatever seed God planted in you, whatever it is that God wants you to be, the word is the only thing that can bring that into maturity. When men leave the voice and the word, to do the maturity, they are positionally placing themselves. The scripture warned against lording over God's heritage. They want to take a position of leadership. They want to take a position of example. They want to... They, 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 they want to position the church where they think it should be positioned. I have no idea of what God's going to do. I'm not looking for chair, wheelchairs to come down this aisle, though they may. I'm not looking for anything to happen but what he's got planned. And I know there's only, you can't produce it. Yeah. A sheep doesn't produce. Right. It bears wool. Amen. A sheep's made to do what? Amen. Eat grass, Amen. bear wool. Right. What's the bride made to do? Amen. Eat word, bear word. Amen. Not produce it. Amen. Not make it happen. Amen. We're not trying to make a revival. We're not trying to fill buildings. We want to mature. We want to bear wool. And that's my stand. That's what drives me. That's what makes me live. Because if I could identify myself, if you would allow me, I was a ragged, long-haired, drug addict hippie sitting on a rooftop. Just left the Catholic Church after trying to study to be a priest. So despondent, 
so away from God that I was on the verge of joining a motorcycle gang and becoming a hell's angel. And if it wasn't for the grace of God, I probably wouldn't even be alive today. But he came into my life and he came into my life by a voice within my spirit, not lip to ear, but within my spirit, within my consciousness, and within my imagination. He, he read to me Romans chapter 1. And saved me. And changed me. Then a few years later, I sat in a, a little home in San Diego with the hippie commune that gathered up because I went to street preaching and, and different people on the street came and they lived with us. Maybe my friend... Bill Zlotoff is listening this morning. If you are, Brother Bill, God bless you. And we gathered together. And we put on a little message called Christianity versus Paganism. And there was that voice. And I knew that was the voice of God. I knew it was the voice that transformed me, and I knew it was the voice that was going to take me all the way. And I listened to another tape, and it was called The Love of God, or When Love Projects. And then I knew that though that tape condemned me, and I didn't think that maybe I wasn't saved after all. Then that voice came to tell me that God loves me. And I can say this morning, I'm not worthy. But God loves me. I couldn't tell you why. I've given him no reason to. But he does. And I'm appreciative. And then I listened to a tape called Choosing of the Bride. And I packed my bags. And I moved to Montana. And lying in my bed in Montana, God told me that I'd preach the gospel in Texas. I didn't know if it was one time or not. It took me several years to get here. And we got here had my children with me for the whole journey. My wife, Sister Leslie, who I think is a model of a pastor's wife, an example of a real Christian lady. My boys may be renegades, but my daughter is always going to be my sweetheart. And I'm here today to stand for this message, to preach this message, and to play these tapes to you. I ask you to endure with my fleshly side and my human side, because I'm working on that too. Yes, sir. But that's not the part that does you any good. There's only one thing that does you good, and that's the voice of the word of God for this day. Let's stay with that voice. Yes. Amen. God bless Amen. you. Amen. Let's all stand this morning. Aren't you thankful we have the word of God? Amen. There's no weapon that can defeat the devil except the word of God. Amen. 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 
Father, I see that we were drawing a line in the sand, and I want to be standing by your side. Let the son and the daughter see. Oh, I surrender in my heart. Oh, I surrender to the king. Oh, and father, I hear me growing louder. The song will go. Oh, and let the sound of your daughter sing. 
that he is before all things and by him all things consist for it pleased the father that in him should all the fullness dwell Lord you have preeminence Lord we want to give you preeminence in this place Lord the gospel that's gone forth this morning Lord may it rest in our souls and our hearts Lord may we adhere to it line up with it Lord and may it Produce a change in us, Lord. It's been demonstrated this morning just as it did for your prophet, Lord. But Lord, may we feel renewed, refreshed, Lord, because this body of sin, Lord, that you said it would be presented blameless, not even reprovable in your sight for what you've done for us. If we hold to this gospel, the hope of this gospel, truly, Lord, is a hope that, that we have, Lord. It's given by you, Lord, that we can look back and realize that our faith has kept us. We live by it. But Lord, we have a hope of a soon appearing of a living Lord Jesus. Lord, that one day you'll break the skies. Lord, what we've held true to will come to pass. Grant it to us, Lord, that everyone that's attended here today, Lord, can, can leave here a much better off person than when they came in, Lord. That there's been bodies touched. Lord, there's been spirits raised, souls converted, Lord. We pray that all these things, when the gospel's preached, we know it's capable. Just quicken it to us now as we go from here. Lord, we ask you to just go with us, lead us, and guide us, bring us back at the appointed time. So we'll give you honor, glory, and the praise. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 Just remember the burdens. Uh, we need some burdens to remain behind to help with the uh, foot washing baskets and, and all of that stuff. Tonight is our communion service. Um, the kids can play outside, but be careful on the uh, uh, right side of the grass is, is wet, and so we certainly don't want them to get wet. Amen. God bless you this morning. I sought the Lord, and he answered me. Hey! 
Hey, hey. 